the Intellectual Gentlemen's Club. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the IGC podcast. I'm Jason Abbott, your host. Again, joined with me is my brother from the same mother, Matt Abbott. Hello. Welcome back, Matt. Great to have you. Thank you, everybody out there, for subscribing, sharing, and getting the word out for the podcast through social media, whether you're rating it on iTunes, finding us on Stitcher, wherever you may find us. Uh, If you're using the support page, again, we really appreciate that. Uh, If you want to support the podcast, the best way to do it is to go to the website, intellectualgentlemensclub.com, and uh, there'll be a backslash for support page. When you get to that support page, you'll see our sponsors for Amazon, Onnit, and Audible.com. There's also a PayPal button in there for uh, donations. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our guest. Uh, this should be an interesting topic today. Um, her name is Dr. Penny Sartori. She is from the South Wales. She worked as an intensive care nurse for 17 years. She received her Ph.D. in 2005 by the University of Wales for leading one of the world's first research programs on near-death experiences. She's an author of many publications on near-death experiences, and her latest book is The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences. Penny, thanks for joining us today. Welcome. Thanks for having me here. So I guess the first question would be, what led you down the path of uh, doing research with near-death experiences? I know that you were a nurse. Did it interest you before that, or... Has this uh, did it pique your interest when you were working in the ICU? I think it peaked really on the ICU. Um, I'd heard of. Um, I can remember when I was a student nurse. You know, a lady had uh, I'd looked after her for ten days in a row, and she'd said to me on the last day, she said, "You know, something happened when I was in the coronary care unit." She said, "My heart stopped, and I had left my body, and I was looking down from above, and I went to heaven, and I met my mother." Now, at the time, I just thought this was some sort of hallucination. And I can remember thinking to myself, oh, she must have had too much diamorphine. And I listened to what she said, and I never really questioned it any further. You know, I just kind of had this preconception that it was a hallucination. So I didn't explore it further. But then as my nursing career progressed, especially when I went to work in the ICU, I started seeing a lot of death. And I... I realise that death happens to people of all ages, young people, not just the old people that you expect to die. But it was one night shift when I was looking after a man who was clearly dying, and I made a connection with him as I was going to continue some nursing care. And it's almost as if I'd swapped places with this man, and I could understand what he was going through. Now, he knew he was dying, he was in great pain, and he was mouthing to me, leave me alone, let me die, let me die in peace. And he couldn't talk because he had a tracheostomy and he was connected to the ventilator. But that connection I made really did have a big impact on me. And it made me think about death. And for the rest of that night shift, I, that's all I could think about. And I was so upset the following day after the night shift, I couldn't sleep. And I phoned work mid-morning to find out how this man was. And they, my colleagues told me that he died about two hours after my shift ended. And that is what really gave me the kind of motivation to study death in more depth. And as I was reading about death, I came across near-death experiences. And uh, I thought, you know, these people are telling us that death is nothing to be afraid of. But because my nurse training was so scientific, I think it really kind of still made me a bit sceptical. But I was still curious at the same time. So the more I read about these experiences, the more intrigued I became. And so I thought, well, I'm working in the ideal environment. Perhaps I should do my own research. And that's what I decided to do. So that's where it stemmed from, really. So when you were working in the ICU, did you, obviously you're around death at that point. Had you heard any of the patients at that point um, who were in your care had any near-death experiences or... Mm -hmm that they had been back with any kind of specific stories at that point or you just got interested in death and then you kind of found uh, the NDEs on your own? Yeah, that's right, because none of the patients had kind of described any of these experiences to me when I was working in the ICU. And it was only really when I started looking for them 
that's when I found them really. And with my research, when I was interviewing the patients, it was really interesting when I came to write up my research because I, it continued for five years. And for those five years, I, I came across 15 patients who'd had an experience. Now, two, only two of them volunteered that information. So the other 13 people said that they would never have disclosed that experience had I not approached them and asked them if they had any memories of the time that they were unconscious. So it's a very underreported phenomenon and people tend not to talk about it because they don't understand it or they think that people are going to think that they're crazy. So, you know, people just don't talk about them. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to ask you, uh, what do you think the reason is that people didn't want to discuss it? But um... Kind of the same same reason people, you know, that supposedly see UFOs or something, they don't want to talk about it. You know, no one would believe them. Everybody thinks they're crazy. Right. Um, not meaning to compare the two, but, you know. Uh-huh. Kind of right. So when you started doing your research on this, where did you start to notice a pattern as far as like percentages of people who were brought back to life had a near death experience and had these type of visions and things like that? So what what, what type of percentage would you say? Right. Well, what I found was in the first year, I interviewed everyone, regardless of whether they came close to death or not, because I thought, well, maybe if they're just in the ICU, that may make them perceive themselves to be closer to death than what they are. And at the end of the first year, I found very few patients who reported the experience. So that there were only two people out of 243 that did have some kind of experience. And that it was very time consuming interviewing everyone. And I couldn't sustain that for another five years. So what I did is I modified the research. And for the next four years, I concentrated only on those who had a cardiac arrest. And I found a big difference in the percentages. So with the patients who'd had the cardiac arrest, it was a smaller group. It was only 39 patients, but seven of them reported having a near-death experience. And so if you look at the frequencies, it, it went from less than 1% of the total sample to nearly 18% of patients who have a cardiac arrest. So I found that quite interesting because it showed that the closer you come to death, the more likely you are to have the experience. Now that's interesting because... The closer you come to death, and if there's a cardiac arrest, um, there's no oxygen getting to the brain at that point. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And uh, the heart stops, and within about 10 to 15 seconds of cardiac arrest, there is no brain function. And so what these patients were reporting really was a heightened state of awareness as well. Now, there are quite a few misconceptions with near-death experiences because people do think that they're quite hallucinatory. But these people described experiences that were realer than real. And it's a heightened state of awareness. And that's something that I can't quite understand, is that when the brain is so severely dysfunctional and so severely physiologically insulted, how can they have this heightened state of awareness? It just doesn't make sense with our current understanding that the brain produces consciousness. So they're having no brain waves at this time where they're going, when they're undergoing this type of experience and, and from what I've read about it it's it seems to be that these experiences are more dynamic than any experience that could be you know on earth as a living body right? we were talking about like 360 vision um, mm -hmm. feelings of telepathy where you're talking with people from your past um, without words uh, instant travel if you want to see somebody who's passed over on the other side you're they're automatically there also, I've heard of... But haven't you? You've had dreams that were similar to that. I yeah, assume. lucid dreams. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to get to that in a little bit. But uh, it, it seems like it, it, it's quite incredible. And we, we talk about psychedelics quite a lot on the podcast here. And, and one of our Facebook uh, followers, um, I let him, I let everybody know out there that I was going to be speaking with you. And one of his questions was, is, uh, what's the similarities between a near-death experience and psychedelic mystic experiences. Um, yeah, there's quite a few mm -hmm. similarities there, you know, and I think when I, I read, I've read quite a lot on these psychedelic experiences as well, and there are very common themes. So it may be that these are both kind of slightly different routes to access in this altered state of consciousness, which is around us all the time. And we don't usually perceive it, but there are certain ways in which you can perceive it. 
So it's, it's again, they're quite similar to peak experiences that are attained during meditation. You can get similar experiences taking psychedelic drugs. So maybe there are many different routes to access in this altered state of consciousness. But with a near-death experience, perhaps it seems that it's more profound because it is the closest that you will come to death before with before annihilation of the body. So I think they are very, very similar experiences in many respects. Now, Matt, I remember some time ago we were talking about different uh, tripec experiences that we had had over the years, and you mentioned one time that you had an experience like this. Do you want to discuss that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I, I uh, the one time where I I, uh, I shot uh, ketamine. Um, I had a out of body experience, which I I pretty much I remember the only thing I remember was saying thinking that I was dying or I was dead, and because I you know I, for me I'm I'm I lean towards more of an atheist and I believe it uh, if I see it type of thing, um, so it was it was it was really a, a different experience for me. Um, but, what was it you like? Know, Were you floating? Above I I saw or? my I saw my my body on bed on my bed and i remember hovering over it and thinking what an idiot i look like <laughs> for the most part <laughs> and uh but you know i i know that that's i i've had psychedelic experience especially with um dmt that you know the the near-death experience um stuff that i've read i i mean that that hits it pretty pretty hard on the some of the experiences i've had with with dmt especially penny i know that uh dmt is well Scientifically, they've they've recently found that DMT in rats is produced in the pineal gland in the brain. Um, uh -huh. so I guess we can only assume that it the same is uh, the same is going on for humans as as DMT. I, I've always had like this kind of theory where I've, I've really been into dreaming for many years and kind of trying to hone my lucid dreaming skills and things like that. But I have this idea that DMT might correlate with dreams and experiences like this. Do you have any? insight on dmt time off the trip to me i think that you know that is quite plausible certainly and it would be great to do more research in this area i know dr rick strassman has done some fantastic work with dmt and i think it's it's time that we built on work like that because again there are very much similarities and i think yeah perhaps we are finding the correlations of these experiences as well so um yeah i would kind of uh, definitely say this needs more research yeah, because I think a lot, a lot of times, you know, uh, especially with, again with with DMT, is the the weird part for me that is that everybody has kind of sees the same has the sem similar experiences, kind of like with out of body ex or near death, um, people all report pretty similar experiences. Um, you know, with with DMT trips, you know, people see the same things that are not there in the physical world. And that's that's pretty mind boggling to me that, you know, you can have multiple people on on other things. But for everybody to channel one vision, you know, is is, is pretty mind blowing. To me. Well, also, uh, th I think there is uh, I, I, from what I've heard is that. It just just because someone is an atheist or just because someone is a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have a near death experience that correlates to the religion. Yeah, from what I've gathered, it, it seems like no, it has absolutely nothing to do with religion. But I've also heard that in certain circumstances, that does play a role. So, Penny, what can you say about that? Yeah, well, it is very much culturally influenced. So, you know, people in the West are more likely to see images of Jesus, but then people in the West are brought up with that imagery as well. Whereas people then in, say, India, for example, um, there's lots of cases where people see a man called Ch Chitragupta, and he's the man with the book, and it's a book of deeds of their life. And what they've done in their life is all recorded in this book, and it decides their fate of where they go afterwards. And so there are very much culturally influenced, but then we, we all have very different cultural views and cultural images as well. And Carl Jung has got a really interesting theory of the, the archetypal realm and the collective unconsciousness. So maybe we're all kind of, when people have these experiences, they're tuning in to that collective unconscious. So there are these archetypal type of visions that they're seeing and they're interpreting it according to their cultural fi um, filter as well. So what, what I was going to say is, you know, if, if everybody's thinking, thinking the same thing and that, you know, 
if the if the mind is if, if the brain is cut off and the, basically the brain is dead, um, how to how does what you've grown up on reference to a, a dead brain? It's an know? interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, so, that is that is a brilliant question, and do you know, I really, I I don't know, I don't have the answers for that, but it would seem to me that it is kind of connected or correlated with the um, accessing of the collective unconscious. But again, if the the brain is not working, how is it that those memories and images that we've been brought up with, how can we kind of access those? So that's a really good point. Yeah. Are you familiar with uh, the work of Rupert Sheltrake? Oh yes. Okay. Great. So yeah. There's, there's different schools of thought, obviously. Um, you have, uh, like, I guess what would be considered the mainstream thought is the body or the meat is a consciousness generator. Um, I, I think that's probably the the mainstream idea of, of where uh-huh. consciousness comes from at this point in the scientific community, at least. Meaning the yeah. brain, your brain, your the brain, piece right. of meat inside your head. Exactly. Um, yeah. But there's also lines of thought like Rupert Sheldrake where... It is uh, stating that the brain is more of a transceiver of consciousness, almost yeah. like an antenna that's bringing yeah. it in. So you're talking about the, you know, the uh, social unconscious or the subconscious. Mm-hmm. I-, I wonder if everybody is tapped in to some type of transceiver. If everybody's mm-hmm. getting information, if they're also putting out information on their cultural system to the unconscious as well. Yeah, that's right. That's a really good point. And I think it does make more sense, certainly in light of the research that I did in the hospital, that the brain is more of a transceiver of consciousness rather than a producer of consciousness. And I think, if you like, the the brain acts like a kind of filter. And this makes more sense to me anyway. And this consciousness is around us all the time, this heightened state of awareness, but we're not usually aware of it because our brain filters it out. But there are times in our life when that filter action becomes dysfunctional. Now it can become dysfunctional as one approaches death during a near-death experience, when when certain psychoactive drugs are taken during certain meditative practices. And that filter action becomes more relaxed. And rather than this consciousness being produced, it's actually allowed into experience. And that makes far more sense to me. So I think we need to explore consciousness from a different perspective because it seems that in light of all the research that's been done now, consciousness isn't produced by the brain. It's just mediated through it. See, I'm not sold on either way. And, you know, I'm just a a layman, you know, for for any type of topic. So I can only go over my opinions and, you know, what kind of information I've I've gotten. Let's take a step back here, and for people who have been tuning in who aren't familiar with so much with near-death experiences, can you talk a little bit about what it is? And I, I know that it's been talked about as early as Plato um, in, in the Republic, I believe. He describes a tale of a soldier named Ur, and uh, it's very similar to modern near-death experiences. Could you give us a, just a brief overview? I know it's widely subjective on experience to experience, but could you give us an overview on Uh, what a near-death experience really is. Yeah, well, um, Dr. Raymond Moody wrote a book called Life After Life in 1975, and he kind of um, defines the near-death experience as a set of components. So these components, it may start with an out-of-body experience where the person looks down from above. Then the person might feel like they go through a dark tunnel towards a bright light. They go into a really uh, lovely realm which is beautiful gardens with lush green grass and vividly coloured flowers. They may meet deceased relatives and friends, and sometimes relatives and friends they didn't know to be dead at the time of the experience. They can meet a being of light, sometimes associated with a religious figure. Sometimes it could just be a presence. They get a life review, and the life review is really quite fascinating because it's described in like a panoramic view, and it's almost as if they're reliving their life in exactly the same way and sometimes they can actually perceive things from a third person perspective as well so if they've been particularly unpleasant to someone or been violent to someone they can feel like what it's like to be on the receiving end of that unpleasantness and that violence but also if they've been particularly nice to someone they they know what it feels like to receive that love and things that they're giving off so it gives them a very big moral undertone really Um, 
very often as well people feel very much interconnected that we're all one that we're all part of this great consciousness and basically what we do to others we're ultimately doing to ourselves as well and very often the people really want to stay where they are because it's a lovely experience but the dead relatives or the being of light will send them back and say it's not their time they have to go so um, after the experience it's really amazing because they are really transformed in many ways as well and it has a very profound effect on the people and there's lots of really fascinating after effects of an experience as well so it's a complex uh, phenomenon and it's not just the case of going through a tunnel it's all of the different other aspects that come with it as well so when somebody comes back generally from a near-death experience what type of changes have you seen people make or uh, what's different about when they're returned do they feel like they have a second chance i can only imagine that that's what it would be like so how, yeah how does right. the behavior change um, it, they do change in profound ways. First of all, they kind of have absolutely no fear of death at all. They say it's not that they want to die, but when their time is right, that it won't be anything to fear because they know they've experienced it before and they're not, they know what to expect. Also, their values change drastically as well. Whereas before they may have been very much um, money orientated, they may have worked long hours. They may have had the nice material possessions like the big car, the big house. All of a sudden, those things have no importance for them at all. And so very often they can even change their careers and they can give up a really high powered, well paid job and um, train to become a nurse or just become a carer. So they have that kind of influence as well. Um, very often as well, their spouses no longer recognize them and no longer understand them. So there can be quite a high divorce rate if, with people who've had a near-death experience. And very often, you know, they kind of, it, it just really does affect the way that they integrate the experience as well. And they feel very isolated most of the time because they feel like no one else, they've got no one else who understands them. And they just have all these changes going on. But also there's some very interesting physiological changes as well. Some people get um, changes in their electromagnetic field. They can't wear a wristwatch after their experience. And very often they don't really associate it with being part of their near-death experience. For no reason this wristwatch will stop working for them. It'll work for other people. Um, sometimes things like electric light bulbs will blow very easily. Um, photocopiers and credit card machines, things like that will malfunction in their presence. They'll work for other people, but not for them. And um, some people get like a healing ability. Uh, some people find that they become quite psychic or they get premonitions of things that are going to happen. And um, sometimes as well, they get like a psychological boost. You know, they, it really kind of like gives them energy from somewhere. And there's a great example of this that I talk about in my book. And there's a lady that I refer to called Sally. And um, she had this horrendous head injury. And she was in the hospital unconscious for quite some time. And they didn't think that she was going to survive. So the doctors had warned her husband and said, it's unlikely that she's going to live. But if she does, she's going to have to learn to walk again because of the extent of her injury. Now, the interesting thing about this is that she did have a near-death experience while unconscious. And as part of the experience, she had this presence with her all the time. And it said to her, you've got a choice. You can stay here or you can go back to life. But if you do go back, you will be stronger. And she said she doesn't remember making a conscious decision, but that voice was with her constantly and she just felt stronger. So she woke up and she was surrounded by people who were her family and she had to learn to recognize them again. And she did learn to walk again. And within a month of being discharged from hospital, she ran a 10 kilometer race. And she said it was that voice that was with her that gave her the strength. Now, further to this, she went on to become an ultra distance runner. And she's been in the Guinness Book of Records three times. And her greatest achievement is running across Australia from Sydney to Melbourne, um, which is 625 miles. And she did that in just eight days without any sleep. And she said the thing that kept her going is that she just totally tuned in to that voice all the time. So it has a really profound and overwhelming effect on people as well. 
That's interesting. The more and more I hear you talk, the more and more it does sound like a like a heavy duty psychedelic experience. I know for myself, after my first major experience of psychedelics, it really profoundly changed my perspective on the world, how I treated other people, how I treated did you, myself. Did you hear like a voice guiding you though? I mean, I've I've yeah. never had an experience. Yeah, I really like did. Um, and I've heard it called, uh, you know, with psilocybin, they call it the logos, and it was it's only, it's a voice that was telling me what I was doing with my life that um, needed to be changed. It directly was speaking to me. And some people will dismiss it as, you know, it's my own subconscious telling me what I already know. Um, I can accept that that is, you know, one available outcome. But I also think that there might be something else that's going on. I, I, there's, there's just too much to the universe to yeah. discount it right away. So, Yeah, I agree totally. And some people during this experience, they can get access to knowledge that they weren't aware of previously. In my hospital research, there was one patient who had an experience and he had a conversation with a dead relative who gave him a message for one of his re living relatives. Now, when he revived, he gave this message to the living relative and she was absolutely astounded that he should know this information because it was something that she'd gone to great lengths to keep a secret from him. So there was that in my hospital research. And I, last year, I spoke at a conference in Marseille in France and I came across this really amazing lady who'd had this experience. And as part of her near-death experience, it was a very overwhelming thing, but she felt that she existed almost on a quantum level. And when she came back to life, she had this understanding and knowledge of quantum physics that she'd never had before. And she'd never been trained in it. She'd never studied it before. And the interesting thing is that they had her university professor that she'd been motivated to go and study it at the university. And they interviewed her professor and he said that he was really puzzled about her level of knowledge because it's not something that you can acquire through just reading books or doing a, a basic course. This is deep seated knowledge that she had. Almost like a rewired. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of similar. Almost you hear stories like that of people getting struck by lightning and things like that happening to them. You well, know? I would think that would be a near death experience. Yeah, but well. I mean it's it's kind of crazy when you when you compare all the all the things together that are similar. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. too much to be a coincidence in my opinion. I know I, I don't know exactly what's going on with everything, but uh Penny, I I ran when I was doing some research about the show here, I came across an article about near death experiences and the blind and the deaf. Uh -huh. And I was it was pretty compelling stuff because some of the people that had never, ever been able to see prior came back from an experience with explaining what colors were and what sounds were if they were deaf. And they had never, ever been able to experience it before. What, yes. Have you have you worked with anybody directly who, have, who with a handicap like that? Um, well, in my research in the hospital, there was one lady who was blind. She did have some sight up until early childhood. Um, but certainly at the time of her experience, she was blind and she did have a perception of seeing light where she could perceive light that she doesn't normally have that perception of, she said. But it, it wasn't something that she could kind of um, describe in depth. She couldn't describe anything around her, but she just had this perception of light. So that was one case. And there was also a lady who I've spoken to who was profoundly deaf and she has been since birth or and um, she, during her near-death experience, could hear a voice. And it was difficult for her to kind of understand it because she'd never heard any sounds before. So it was di very difficult for her to describe, but she believed that she'd heard this voice during her near-death experience. So it is, it's, it's such a fascinating thing. And the more cases that I get, you know, I've been having a lot of people email me lately since my book came out. And it's just it's absolutely amazing how many different cases there are and how these experiences are just, they can't be explained away either, you know. And I think it's something that we really need to look into in far more depth and take them far more seriously. Now, I know that uh, there was a Hollywood movie that came out, uh, I believe it was in 2010. Some of your work was attributed to helping the film. That was the Clint Eastwood film, uh, The Hereafter. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh -huh. I saw that film when it came out and, you know, I took it for, you know, just a film that was I didn't realize that it had any undertones about, 
you know, things based on a true story or anything like that. I think it was, from what I remember, it's it's largely about a psychic who is in touch with the other side and uh, can have these visions all the time. But it, what you're talking about earlier was if, after somebody has a near-death experience, they're more apt to be in touch with that same type of realm. Is that right? Yes, yes they can be. They can develop it's kind of like... Um, like a sixth sense, if you like, and mm -hmm. sometimes they just develop this awareness that they didn't have previously. So um, I know a colleague of mine who I used to work with had a near-death experience at the age of nine, and she very she's very intuitive and she can tell when someone is going to be unwell, and she gets like premonitions as well. And it's something that she it scares her. She doesn't like it, and she tries to block it out as much as she can. Because she can, she feels like she's able to read people's minds, and she feels like it's intruding on people's privacy. But not also that only that. She said she can see unpleasant things that are going to happen, and she doesn't like to have this ability. So she really does try and block it out. And I've come across a few others who also have a similar thing where they've developed this kind of sense, and um, they really don't like it. But there is another lady as well who I've recently been in contact with and she's kind of worked that to her advantage because she can intuitively pick up on when someone is unwell and she, as a result she's saved about 25 people's lives because she can sense when something is going to go wrong and she pays particular attention. So she's a really fascinating lady to talk to. Sounds like she's got that Spider-Man sense. <laughs> yeah, a little tingled. A lot, a lot of a lot of uh, animals have that actually. Yeah, you know, like uh, our dog and stuff. And when we're when they're not feeling good, even before, like it seems like they they seem to know. It's mm -hmm. pretty strange. There's uh also we were talking about Rupert Sheldrake earlier. I believe he has an experiment um, about uh, dogs knowing when their owners are on their way home. Yes, that's right. It's fascinating. Yeah. Can you explain that? Fascinating. I don't know too much about it, Penny. Do, do you, are you, are you familiar with that work at all? Yeah, I've um, I, he's got a great book which I've read, and um, he had a documentary which I watched on television. And indeed, you know, he put the owners out to work, or he sent them off, and they came back at random times during the day. So it wasn't just that they would do home at three o'clock in the afternoon; it was all random. And uh, yeah, you could you could see the CCTV was on the actual pet, and the dog would wait at the door and start moving around probably about 20 minutes before the, the owners actually wow. came home. Yeah, it was really interesting stuff. He's also He also has a, an ongoing experiment. I don't know if it's still going on. I know it was last year where if you go onto the website, you guys can Google this out there if you're interested in it, but it'll actually generate a phone call to somebody, and there's some type of perception where they know that – like. Uh, you know, it happens before. Everybody has almost experienced it where you look at your phone and you expect a phone call and boom, your phone rings. Uh -huh. Something like that. So it's an experiment that has to do with that as well. I think it's um, around that same lines with like these extra perception things that we can't necessarily explain. I've had, it, I've had it to me definitely to where my phone has been in another room and I feel my pocket vibrate. And my yeah. phone is not in the pocket. And ring, it's, in yeah. the, it's in the next room, but it rings. It's really strange, too. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I've had a few experiences like that, particularly like with my mum. If I knew that I, I'd think of my mum, next thing she'd phone and things like that. Right. So, yeah, I think it's something that we all have, but perhaps we just don't pay attention to it. Do you think with a near death, death uh, it, it kind of exposes that part of the brain, maybe? And. Yeah, you know, it may well door, it, perhaps. It, yeah. yeah, make us more sensitive to these experiences, and so then we do pay more attention afterwards as well. So yeah, it could well be. I think anything that's very traumatic that happens in your life kind of unlocks certain things in your in your brain that weren't there before. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like people. You know, some of the most amazing people that I know have been through the hardest shit. Oh yeah. You know, people who have gone through a really hard death, you mm -hmm. know, in, in the family or extreme poverty or extreme mm -hmm. loss or handicaps or anything like that. It seems like you really have to be forged in a fire to make steel. You yeah. know, if you want that Japanese steel, you know, yeah. it's got to be forged in the fire. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That makes sense. Yeah. It's usually the most humble people, too. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> 
Absolutely. Uh, Penny, you're a scientist. So where is the data behind all this as far as, you know, it's, it's great that we could talk about um, these ideas and things like that. And I'm sure mm -hmm. a lot of people do find it interesting. But where is the data behind this? What kind of hard information do you have as a scientist where we can dictate and can lead people to believe that this is what's happening? Do you have any data like that? Well, I think, you know, when you do work in, in the hospital, like uh, previous research, which has been collected kind of anecdotally, it's very difficult then to ascertain exactly how close to death these people were, if indeed they were close to death at all. Um, we don't know if they were given what drugs they were given. We don't know what their kind of blood status was like. But now that this kind of work is being done in the hospital, we can check those details. So I think we're doing more and more research in hospitals, and so we're going to get more and more kind of evidence as well. And so with the research that I did, what I was able to look at was, first of all, how close this person was to death. Then if they claimed to have any experience, uh, especially if it was the out-of-body experience, I would then kind of go and I would interview the members of staff who were looking after the patient at the time. And then I would see if the report of what the patient told me was the report of what actually happened, if they correlated and if they were correct. And I looked at the blood results where I could. It couldn't. It wasn't possible with all of the patients, but with some of them it was. And I looked at the drugs that we gave the patients as well. So I think by analysing all of the data, we have more kind of um, scientific evidence to kind of look at the theories that these are because a lot of people would think that these experiences are just due to lack of oxygen or due to the drugs that we give but yeah. what i found is that some people had this experience and they were ventilated at the time and they had it and they didn't have a cardiac arrest either at this point they were just unconscious but they were well oxygenated throughout and there is a case where blood was actually extracted during the time they were having this experience but the, the blood levels were actually quite normal. And then also I looked at the, the drugs that we give the patients, and there were some cases where patients were given uh, had this experience but weren't given any drugs at the time. And there is a really fascinating case that I did, that, that I uncovered really with my research, where a patient I was looking after, um, he became unconscious very quickly, and he then, when he regained consciousness, described this out-of-body experience and he very accurately described which doctor had examined him and what he'd done. He accurately described the physiotherapist poking her head around the curtains looking very worried and he also re reported what the nurse had done cleaning his mouth and I know that this is correct because I was the nurse and I was there at the time but he was deeply unconscious when all of these things were going on and um, he also then after his out-of-body experience, he also went into a pink room where he met his dead father and his dead mother-in-law and a Jesus-type figure. And he said it was great. He really enjoyed this experience. It was lovely. And the Jesus-type figure said, no, you've got to go back. It's not your time. And as he said this, he said, kind of drifted backwards into his body. But after the experience, he said that um, he misinterpreted one of my questions. And... Um, I said, when you were out of your body, was there anything that you could do that you can't normally do? And he said, oh, yeah, look at my hand. Now, his right hand, this man has cerebral palsy. And so his right hand had been in a permanently contracted position from birth. And after his experience, he can now open it out fully. And I didn't really understand the significance of that at the time. But um, when I discussed this with the doctors and the physios, they said that this shouldn't be physiologically possible without an operation to release the tendons because his, his tendons would be in a permanently contracted position. So that's an aspect that can't be explained away either. So I think the more cases like this we gather in the hospital setting, and then we can check them against the medical notes, the more sort of evidence that we're going to get about these experiences. So as far as brain waves go, uh, I know with dreaming states, they're associated with alpha, delta, uh, theta waves. Uh, I forget exactly where they lay in there, but there's different brain waves that you have through a sleep pattern. Mm -hmm. um, are there any brain waves that are that can be registered if somebody has a cardiac arrest? Well, no. According to the the w research that's been done, 
after about 10 to 15 seconds the the brain waves flatline so there's no brain waves there is that so what the, you can, is that what they call brain, being brain dead no uh, no because the the deep brain structure it was are uh, are still we don't really know how the deep brain structures are functioning you see the brain's very slippery isn't it aha uh -huh, yeah, yeah that's right and it may well be that the, the very deepest structures are still active in some form. So I don't know. I have, I have to keep an open mind to it, really. So, but I think co for conscious experience, you have, the cortex has to be functioning. And after 10 to 15 seconds, there's, there's no function there. I was just reading um, an article about how they have some method now to some sort, sort of brain surgery that they actually... Um, put the patient um, in, like, kill them basically for them to work on what they need to work on, and then actually bring them back to they life. Bring their body down to a cold temperature, right? Like, yeah, yeah, but I think it's, it's, it's a pretty long years. time from what I remember reading, and it was. Um, I'm just wondering if, if what, what percentage of those people, if they've, they, if they've had experiences like that, I wonder. Yeah, there are a few cases documented where people have had this procedure. Uh, the most well-known of these cases is the case of Pamela Reynolds, and she had this aneurysm in her brain. And again, what they they had to shut down her brain. They had to drain the blood, go into the brain, cool down her body, and she reported this very deep near-death experience. Uh, part of it was an out-of-body experience where she very accurately described the the different um, equipment that yeah. was used. And and so yeah, it's it's just such a fascinating thing. But these cases are quite few and far between. And it would be great if we could continue to research them, really. So I think we need to continue with this because we're just really scratching the surface of something that we don't know much about. And I think consciousness is something that is really going to be a big focus of future research. You know, with 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 a lot of these things we've been talking about, whether you're talking about near death experience, lucid dreams, out of body experiences, meditation, psychedelic, any type of mystical experiences, I think that a lot of people can just roll their eyes at this and say, "Ah, oh, it's just mm -hmm. silliness." You know, these these people, um, you know, they're just making up stories. There's there's the, there's no proof that any of this has happened. So, what what would you say to the the haters out there? I, I think it's just important to keep an open mind because I was like that, you know, I really did think of that as well. And I had so many preconceptions about experiences like this that I wasn't really open to kind of understanding them or exploring them in more depth. But it's only since I've really engaged with these experiences because it's easy to take things at surface value. But when you really engage with them and really look at them in depth, it gives you a totally different perspective. And I think for me, because I work in that area, well, I did work in that area of nursing, I, I just think it was essential for me to be more open to those experiences. And, um, you know, I really do hope that these experiences are going to become more well known and taken on board. And I think, you know, in the recent years, I've noticed a very big change in attitude. When I first started researching these experiences 20 years ago, a lot of people just completely dismissed them and many people wouldn't talk about them at all but yet 20 years later what I'm finding is that people are far more willing to talk about the experience and not only that people are more open-minded to it as well so I think it, it's important to kind of like have an open mind to these experiences because we don't know the answers yet you know there's a lot more work to be done but I think it's important that we don't dismiss them anymore because they're very valid experiences and I think people who have the experience need to be supported when coming to terms with what's happened to them as well. Yeah, I can imagine it could be pretty devastating when you go through an experience like that and then you tell somebody that you really trust or care about and they just kind of look at you like you're fucking crazy, you know? Well, I mean, what, what reason do these people have to lie? You know, I have, it seems like half of these people uh, don't, don't want people to know who, who they are yeah. because they're so embarrassed they don't by it. don't want to say anything. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that's a shame. I think... You know, the as time goes on, it seems to me that like the whole scientific community seems to be lightening up a little bit on the whole things that can't be explained necessarily. Using science, paranormal da, 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 stuff, da, da, da. and yeah, I mean paranormal. stuff stuff right, that you yeah. can't run regular scientific tests on to prove if it's right or wrong. Things, not everything is that that simple and easy. I, I understand, that. cut and dry. It's a, a lot. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people like our like 
what I just, you know, with these experiences that they chalk it up to parapsychology or something like that. But there's yeah. definitely something to it. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, so. that's right. And I think it's just we have to be more open minded and continue to research it. I just think it's really exciting because we're making more discoveries all the time. And I just think there's so much more for us to learn and discover. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your book? Um, yeah, well, my book started off really um, mainly because when I was working in the intensive care unit, a lot of my colleagues didn't really understand near-death experiences. And so I thought, well, I think it's really important that people get a really good understanding of what they are. And so I've and over the years, so many people have emailed me and written to me with their experiences and they're just so fascinating, these cases. So I thought, well, if I put them all together into a book and kind of give the background to what a near death experience is and the sort of history of the research into it and also the, all the different effects and the different cultural perspectives. And there's also things like deathbed visions that people kind of don't really know much about so I thought I'd put them all into sort of one book and then look about what um, these experiences can teach us because what I found as well is that we're so often we, we're debating what these experiences are and what they're not that we're missing the very important message of the experience as well and I think people who have this experience have so much to tell us and I think the underlying message of the experience is that we're all interconnected and basically what we do to others um, impacts on other pe on ourselves ultimately. And so the, the ultimate message is the golden rule, which is treat others as you'd wish to be treated yourself. And that's at the heart of all the wisdom traditions as well. And so I think that's a really important message to live by. And I think when you really start to learn about death, that's really when you start to learn about life. So I think it's kind of taking what these people have, are telling us and then applying it to our lives, you know, and we can all benefit then without having to nearly die. So I think it's got a really positive message and it would be great really to empower people through having that message. I think it's really cool also where when you think about life and death, mm -hmm. all life on Earth basically came from the death of a star. I mean, the mm -hmm. cycle of the universe just keeps going and going and going. You know, we can... Look yeah. back 15 billion years, that's when the Big Bang happened. Um, you know, there's all different types of theories about how we came to be and all that. But one thing's for sure is that the atoms in our body were created from a dying star, you know, shedding. Uh, everything is the same in that sense. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I'd never thought of that. Yeah, wow. Well, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one question I had also from another one of our Facebook uh, followers, um, he wanted to hear about anybody who who had been to hell and back, quite literally. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, have you ever had anybody have such a, a negative experience and come back and be like, I saw Satan, I saw the you know devils, and was there any anything that sticks out in your mind specifically like that? Yeah, there was one lady in the hospital research, and she had a cardiac arrest. And when I interviewed her, she started telling me that, yeah, she remembered all of a sudden she was on this lake. She was looking at a lake and there was a lady and she was in this boat and she had a straw hat on her head. And she said, I didn't know this lady, but I was afraid of her and I knew I had to keep away from her. And then she saw a, like a ring of lights, uh, almost like a Catherine wheel firework. And that was spinning. And then she said, and that's when I started feeling the heat of hell. And she said, I was looking into hell. Those were the flames of hell coming up. And she started to describe this. But as she, as she started describing it, she became very distressed and frightened. And then she started to cry. And she almost got to the point of hysteria. And I had to terminate the interview because she was getting so disturbed about what she had experienced. But she believed that she was looking into hell and that she was on her way to hell. And it really did frighten her. And she was looking to me for reassurance that it wouldn't happen again. So all I could say to her was that there are cases like this in the literature. And they've kind of turned into then a pleasant experience as well. But there's far less research with the hellish type of experiences. Because people, again, they don't want to talk about them because 
it's almost as if there's some sort of stigma and it's like well i went to hell why didn't i have a pleasant experience and so people are afraid to talk about them for that reason they may think it reflects badly on the way that they've led their life but there's actually no research to say that good people have a nice experience and bad people have a bad experience so i think we need to do a lot more research into these experiences and um we need to support people who are going through it because it is it's a traumatic experience and it's almost to the point where they can have post-traumatic stress as well after it but there is um an interesting case there's a doctor who's got his own website dr rajiv party and he had a near-death experience a few years ago and it, his started in a very unpleasant way and he felt that he was going down to this place where there was raging storms in the background he could see fires he could smell burning flesh and he could feel people putting pins into his body and stabbing him and he said it, that was a horrible experience but then he had this insight and realization into the way that he was living his life and he said i was living my life without any forgiveness without any compassion for others and he said as soon as i had that realization it turned into something pleasant where his dead father and his dead grandfather appeared and they took him on to this really pleasant and wonderful near-death experience so yeah people do get these horrible hellish experiences and i think it's so important that we pay attention to these as well so it so seems like you learn more from those experiences than the good experiences i would think <laughs> Yeah, they do. And in fact, a lot of people say that it's it acted like a wake up call for them. So it, it was like a wake up call to the way that they were living their life. And they thought, right, I've been living like this. I need to change my ways. And so sometimes it did have a very beneficial effect on them as well, in that it did kind of like motivate them to change their lifestyle. You know, it's 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 been great to talk with you. Where can we find you and where can the listeners uh, get your book? Uh, you can get my book at um, most bookshops. You can get it from Amazon. Um, and I've got a website out there as well, which is www.drpennysartori.com. And I've got a blog as well. So just put my name into Google and you'll find my blog and my website. Okay. We're going to throw those up on uh, episode notes as well, people. So just check out the link on the podcast to uh, reach out to Dr. Sartori. Um, I, I just want to thank you again, uh, Doctor, for being on. Uh, it's been very enlightening. It's uh, Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. <laughs> well, our music, uh, our intro music today was brought to you by Secrets once again. Um, you can check out the website at intellectualgentlemensclub.com. You can find all our blog posts and podcasts on there for free. You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube. Uh, we're on Twitter and Facebook. We're pretty active on there. And, uh, again, you can uh, visit the support page and help us out there if you'd like. Um, our exit music today is brought to you by a U.K. artist called Blackmail, and that track is called The Journey's End. Hang loose out there, everyone. Right.
I never said I was a gentleman, motherfuckers. Actually, 